Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. As always, it is Nick here, back through your daily crypto news and analysis. And I hope that you were all having a beautiful day or a beautiful night wherever you guys are out there in the world. Um, as we do start to see a lot of these organizations like the GBBC, which is the Global Blockchain Business Council, really igniting the push on crypto regulations and even adoption uh, through specific big players. We're going to be talking about that. Um, I do think that it's good to address and actually focus on the names uh, that they are telling you to focus on. We're going to talk about that. We're going to address it. But also, there are some pretty big moves being made by the GBBC that could very well benefit some pretty large players like Ripple as well in the process. So let's talk about who the GBBC actually is. So we have developing the next multi-trillion dollar industry through education, partnership, and standards. And here are some of their activities. They have policy and regulatory engagement, events, even open learning forum. And here are some of the news releases that they've uh, given out just recently. We do know that the GBBC is actually working with some pretty large groups, like even the Digital Pound Foundation, which just got announced back in April. Uh, we know that they've been working with Hedera for a very long time. Um, and I believe that Ripple's also on their agenda. Um, but I do know over here, when we go to the about section, in terms of just how large they actually are, we have who we are. Global Blockchain Business Council is the largest leading industry association for the blockchain technology and digital assets community. Launched in Davos in 2017, the GBBC is a Swiss-based nonprofit with more than 500 institutional members and 301 ambassadors across 117 jurisdictions and disciplines. The organization is dedicated to furthering adoption of blockchain technology by convening regulators, business leaders, and global change makers to foster collaboration and advance dialogue to create more secure, equitable, and functional societies. Uh, the GBBC includes several initiatives, which is the financial services um, group as well. This is including post-trade distributed ledger PTDL group, the Interwork Alliance, Global Standards Mapping Initiative, International Journal of Business Law, the BITA Standards Council, the GBBC Labs, um, GBBC Giving, and recently the US Blockchain Coalition as well. And these are all of those big um, players. And again, they just continue to expand and expand and expand. And uh, now we have over here, and big shout out to uh, Kyle for this, and we and his uh, at name is Sphinx Marine. But we have the Global Blockchain Business Council, the GBBC, has released an infographic detailing the contrasting approaches of the USA and Europe in regulating stablecoins. The USA's Loomis Gillibrand Payment Stablecoin Act of 2024 allows state non depository trust companies to issue payment stablecoins up to $10 billion, preserving the dual banking system and requiring comprehensive risk management. Europe, under the Markets in Crypto Assets Regulation, MECA, categorizes electronic money tokens, EMTs, and imposes strict regulations, including a compliance deadline by June 30th of 2024. GBBC, a nonprofit focused on blockchain education and standards, highlights these regulatory frameworks to aid in understanding the evolving landscape of digital assets. And here we have the full breakdown of the stable divide USA versus Europe approach to regulating stablecoins fact card updated May 3rd, 2024. And you can see that introduced on April 17th of this year, not voted on yet. This is the Loomis Gillibrand Payment Stablecoin Act of 2024. And then we also have Mika over here entered into force in June of 2023, applies in two phases in, of course, this year. Um, and these are the full breakdowns of uh, stablecoins. And we can see pretty much every single thing that uh, Kyle did outline for us. Now, outside of this, right, how is this going to affect the entire market? How is this going to affect stablecoins in general? Well, you can't afford to not be a part of this Discord. You need to join the free Discord down in the description below as well as in the comments below right now to get ahead of the rest of the market with 24-7, 365 access to information around crypto, including insights, trades, all coin gems, you name it, you need to be a part of this Discord. So what are you waiting for? Click the link down in the description below as well as in the comments below to join today. Over here, we have um, another great video clip, and this is actually regarding CBDCs versus stablecoins. And we have, I, pref I prefer these private sector leading in payments, and that's why we're still working on a payment stablecoin bill that will let the private sector here lead in that manner on a dollar back stablecoin. And this is from XRP Drops. Now, what's crazy about this is, like I said, going back to this breakdown of how how will all of this work? How is you know Tether going to play into this? How is Circle going to play into this? 
We're going to find out here in a second, but listen uh, quickly to this 26 second long clip. As we look at the future of the internet, Web3 and blockchain, he also said that he was not supportive of a U.S. Uh, central bank digital currency, which I think is a good position. I prefer the private sector leading in payments, and that's why we're still working on a payment stablecoin bill that will let the private sector here lead in, the, lead in that manner on a dollar-backed uh, payment stablecoin. Now, remember, this is French Hill. This is a congressional member. And you know, as we really look at a lot of these, um, you know, big moves happening around this space, specifically stablecoin, CBDCs, the discussions on who is going to lead the, the path forward. As a lot of it seems to be these private sector players like Ripple. Ripple is a private entity. They are very transparent. They're very open, but they are technically a private company. And it seems as though they are leading the uh, way in terms of payments and payment initiatives. And stable coins are definitely a big focus point. Over here, we got a big update. Big shout to Eleanor Tourette. We have new the House Financial Services Digital Assets uh, Subcommittee will discuss tokenizing real world assets in a hearing next Wednesday. Wonder if Carlos Domingo or anyone from BlackRock will be asked to testify. And here we have hearing notice subcommittee on digital assets, financial technology and inclusion. And this is going to be held um, June 5th. We have today the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry, announced the following hearing. Digital Assets, Financial Technology and Inclusion Subcommittee hearing entitled Next Generation Infrastructure, How Tokenization of Real World Assets Will Facilitate Efficient Markets. Very, very interesting at a time where we're now starting to see everything being tokenized. And guess what you're going to need? You're going to need stable coins within that discussion. You're going to need a marketplace. You're going to need custody services. Ripple seems to pretty much have everything locked down within their overall tech stack. And talking about that, let's go over here to want to know why Ripple is building a stablecoin because it is the cornerstone of liquidity. Big shout out to subjective views for this. We have private crypto asset companies, digital companies like Ripple using XRPs of bridge currency to move money. The big differentiator they have in the market is that they're doing it in three seconds rather than three days to move international payments. This is Nina Mafa is a partner at Paul Hastings LLP, a UK based law firm. She focuses on providing legal and commercial advice on regulatory requirements across Europe and helping regulated firms comply with uh, evolving obligations. She's an expert in cross-border offerings involving crypto asset products and product design. She also assists clients with their relationships with the regulators for registration issues relating to digital assets. Check this out back now and sort of think about the, the regulatory frameworks and the policy objectives more broadly. I mean, I'm just wondering if you could sort of kick off, um, you know, some of the regulatory concerns regarding uh, these different instruments that we're talking about today, including things like, you know, the, the you know, stability, uh, competition with fiat, uh, implications for monetary sovereignty. Yeah, I think let's focus on I think e-money, as Diego says, has been around a long time in the UK and the EU as a concept and sort of started in that traditional sense of a, a prepaid card and has been stretched. But I think where the focus has been frankly, from the legislative perspective in the UK and the EU, and particularly in the UK, is, is on stable coins. And I think to think about the regulatory concerns, you take a step back and say, well, what do they do? You know, what are the use cases for them? Um, and the UK government has has recognised that stable stable coins paved the way for faster and cheaper payments and that the use of stable coins has been on the rise for some time. Um, uh, the UK government reported that in June 2020, the value of transactions in stable coins exceeded Bitcoin for the first time and we're seeing in continued growth of stable coin use. Um, so certainly from the UK perspective, I think it's also true from the European bodies and, and, and you know, certain other regulators and governments is that, you know, if there can be appropriate standards of regulation imposed, then stable coins do have the potential to play a really vital role in retail and cross-border payments, including settlement, and to deliver things of speed and efficiency and resilience. I think you already see that in the market with the likes of, um, you know, private crypto asset companies, digital companies like Ripple using XRP as a bridge currency to move uh, money. And the big differentiator they have in the market is that they're doing it in three seconds rather than three days to move international payments. So I think you're seeing a lot more. I also think that you see in the payment in the crypto ecosystem, uh, stablecoins being effectively the, the cornerstone of liquidity. 
um, if you deal with crypto asset firms, that that is, you know, they're always looking at the stable coins. So in against that backdrop of what they are and what they can be, there are risks, right? You know, the more widely they're used as a means of payment, the more uh, financial stability and real economy risks they pose. Um, the UK government has certainly recognised that there is an intrinsic risk to consumers. There's a risk of misunderstanding. You know, what are they? And I think Diego made that PO. What are they? Are they a regulated money product? Are they unregulated? What, what uniform do they wear? And therefore, what protections do consumers um, and market participants who use them have? But I think the big thing that sticks out to me with stablecoin risk as compared to CBDCs is that, uh, you know, the, the pre preeminent ones in the market are private issued. So you are taking the risk of the issuer because, you know, there is some sort of claim against that issuer. You know, you're taking the risk of third parties in the ecosystem that move those stable coins around. So, you know, that that is a big key risk. So as a result of all of this, and potentially what I think you're seeing is certain market dominance of certain stablecoin issuers as well. Um, I think that's what's prompting the, yeah, certainly the UK government to decide to address those risks with the idea of moving this into kind of uh, a more regularized environment so that stablecoins can continue to develop and flourish, and maintain a stable value as well is that you'll get, you're seeing UK regulation, for example, coming in for fiat-backed stable coins. There will be a regulatory framework. There will be regulation for prudential and conduct purposes. So I think that's sort of a kind of chronology of the why and, and, and why we're seeing regulation in, in certainly in the UK and EU from a stable coin perspective. So you guys have it. And again, you know, as we really look at this, it's it's a huge thing to have these prominent figures around regulation and with the knowledge that Nina does have to really kind of emphasize, you know, how significant a company like Ripple is um, and the, the game changer that they have behind XRP as well in terms of their offering and what's happening around the regulatory landscape and, uh, as well and how it will benefit a company like Ripple that has been planning for so long around these things. It's it's very significant to know this, right? But also, yeah, like Ripple is is building a stablecoin and and doing this because it's not only going to benefit them greatly, but it's also going to emphasize what they already have in terms of a product offering. It's going to benefit that even more and ultimately level it up. I'm very excited about this. And also, like I said, going back to regulatory landscapes, like how is this going to affect the, the prominent leaders around the stablecoin space? But over here we have Exchange Kraken FX is considering removing support for stablecoin Tether in the US or sorry in the EU as new Mika regulations approach. And I also do think that this is going to pertain to the US. I think that this is going to set pace for what the US will do um, going forward as well in terms of Tether. How do we know this? Well, pay attention. Over here we have Tether won't be uh, there in Europe because it's not Mika compliant. This is Robert um, Koplich. This is Blockchain for Europe uh, Secretary General. Check it out doesn't mean that this won't change, especially as the digital euro will take some time and there's a gap now and somebody needs to fill the gap. So maybe they turn a blind eye and say, like, OK, let, let them go till we have a digital euro or it will be just an unknown situation where, you know, Tether won't be there in Europe uh, because it's not Mika compliant and some others might be also gone. So you guys have it again over here. We have Brad Garlinghouse loud and clear. I am pro Tether. The U.S. government is not pro tether. That means there may be shifts in market share. Check it out. So in the incumbents today, you have tether and USDC as the primary. Look, I think I'm pro tether. The U.S. government is not pro tether, uh, and that means I think there may be shifts in market share. I think for Ripple, given where we focus as a company around financial institutions. So you guys haven't again, this is from Brad Garlinghouse. He's even telling you like, hey, the US government is not pro tether and, you know, he will know best. Listen, as we really look at the connections back to Ripple, we know that Ripple has been in those private discussions. We know that just recently uh, Ripple was in a meeting actually with uh, Nina or uh, Nelly Liang, sorry, um, talking about stablecoin initiatives and what's happening around the regulatory front within the US addressing, you know, tokenization and stable coins and payments and CBDCs. So listen, as we as we look at Tether, I do think that it is a ticking time bomb in, in the sense that it will essentially, you know, cease to exist with regulations. 
that might be you know something crazy to say but in my opinion as we do really kind of look at where uh ripple is kind of positioning themselves it's pretty clear it's pretty clear that their stablecoin could very well eat up a large portion of the of the dominance around stablecoins and the market share we have over here ripple stablecoin is superior to usdc and usdt remember when usdc uh depegged see post below circle couldn't move usdc when they stepped in that's partly because i think circle doesn't have a big balance sheet ripple has 20 to 30 billion dollars in balance sheet behind it ripple could repeg the stablecoin check it out the second thing Circle stepped in and said, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll stand in the, that gap that, that went down to 93 cents. And Circle said, we guarantee a dollar. And it, USDC didn't move. Now, it's partly because I think Circle doesn't have a big balance sheet. Had Ripple said that at the same time, I think you would have seen USDC regain its peg because Ripple has $20, $30 billion in balance sheet behind it, which I think would have been a positive thing. So, look, I think USDC is going to continue to be very successful. I think. You know, uh, the, the Ripple stablecoin, which we haven't really announced the name around yet, but uh, I'm very optimistic. There's a lot of market share there. There's a lot of growth. And so uh, I'm excited. We're going to workshop a few brand names, right? And there you guys have it. And, and, you know, again, Ripple does have all the ammunition that they need to really kind of take over the stablecoin market. And I do think that this was the plan since day one. I feel as though Ripple has been... I mean, maybe it's me, right? Maybe it's just my thought process, but I feel as though Ripple has been planning um, a very significant game plan since day one to really kind of become a very large leader in the space. And I feel as though they already have. And by the way, over here we have from Chad Steingerber, Brad Garlinghouse states explicitly that the US government is not pro-tether and will never be in favor due to it being based in the British Virgin Islands and incorporated in Hong Kong. The Ripple RL USD uh, stablecoin will be US based and 100% backed by the US government. And I do think that, like I said, Ripple does stand at the, the center point of all things around the U.S. and, you know, the government. I feel as though they have been taking into accountability, compliance and regulation since day one. I feel as though right now Ripple has been cornering this market from pretty much every single vantage point, And now it's time for them to take over. And I do think that their stablecoin is going to be an absolute game changer. And I feel as though in a very short amount of time, that stablecoin is is going to grow astronomically in not only volume, but also value and also even adoption. So with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did, definitely leave a like, subscribe to notifications on because more free content. You guys are more than welcome to follow me on Twitter and join the free Discord in the description below. And with that being said, guys, it's been Nick. Thanks for watching. Peace out.